tough baby. There's a certain gesture of virility, be it one's own or someone else's, that calls for suspicion. It expresses independence, sureness of the power to command, the tacit complicity of all males. Earlier this was called with awed respect the whim of the master. Today it has been democratized, and film heroes show the most insignificant bank clerk how it is done. Its archetype is the handsome, dinner-jacketed figure returning late to his bachelor flat, switching on the indirect lighting and mixing himself a whiskey and soda. The carefully recorded hissing of the mineral water says what the arrogant mouth keeps to himself, that he despises anything that does not smell of smoke, leather, and shaving cream, particularly women, which is why they precisely find him irresistible. For him, the ideal form of human relations is the club, that arena of a respect founded on scrupulous unscrupulousness. The pleasures of such men, or rather of their models, which are seldom equaled in reality, for people are even now better than their culture, all have about them a latent violence. This violence seems a threat directed against others, of whom such a one, sprawling in his easy chair, has long ceased to have, to have need. In fact, it is past violence against himself. If all pleasure has preserved within it earlier pain, then here pain as pride in bearing it is raised directly, untransformed as a stereotype, to pleasure. Unlike wine, each glass of whiskey, each inhalation of cigar smoke, still recalls the repug repugnance that it cost the organism to become attuned to such strong stimuli, and this alone is registered as pleasure. He men are thus, in their own constitution, what film plots usually present them to be, masochists. At the root of their sadism is a lie, and only as liars do they truly become sadists, agents of repression. This lie, however, is nothing other than repressed homosexuality presenting itself as the only approved form of heterosexuality. In Oxford, two sorts of students are distinguished, the tough guys and the intellectuals. The latter, through this contrast alone, are almost automatically equated with the effeminate. There is much reason to believe that the ruling stratum on its way to dictatorship becomes polarized towards these two extremes. Such disintegration is the secret of its integration, the joy of being united and the lack of joy. In the end of the tough guys, in the end, the tough guys are the truly effeminate ones who need the weaklings as their victims in order not to admit that they are like them. Totalitarianism and homosexuality belong together. In its downfall, the subject negates everything which is not of its own kind. The opposites of the strong man and the compliant youth merge in an order which asserts unalloyed the male principle of domination. In making all without exception, even supposed subjects, its objects, this principle becomes totally passive, virtually feminine.